While igloos might seem like just cool-looking snow houses to most people, they represent an ingenious survival technology that allowed Inuit communities to thrive in harsh Arctic conditions. These remarkable structures can maintain indoor temperatures around 60 degrees Fahrenheit, even when outside temperatures plunge to minus 50 degrees Fahrenheit. Such an impressive feat doesn't happen by accident. It's the result of thousands of years of architectural knowledge of Inuit builders. From emergency shelters during hunting trips to seasonal homes, igloos demonstrate how traditional knowledge can create comfort in one of Earth's most challenging environments. The history of igloo stretches back over 4,000 years, proving that good housing ideas really can stand the test of time. The word itself comes from igloo in the Inuit language, which simply means house, though these days saying igloo house would be like saying house house. While movies often show all Inuit people living in igloos year-round, that's about as accurate as claiming everyone in Texas lives on a ranch. In reality, igloos were mainly used as temporary shelters during hunting trips, a practice that continues among modern Inuit hunters. These skilled builders can construct an emergency igloo in just a couple of hours, which sure beats pitching a tent in minus 40 degrees Fahrenheit weather. But enough with the history lesson. Let's dive into how you can start building an igloo why ourself. Building an igloo isn't as simple as piling up any old snow. It requires a specific type of snow. The secret lies in what scientists call sintered snow, which forms when wind packs snow crystals so tightly together that they actually bond at a molecular level. This isn't your average fluffy snowman material. We're talking about snow so compact you can barely stick your finger into it. The Inuit have developed a clever method to find this perfect snow known as the stick test. They walk around poking a traditional hunting stick into different snow banks, looking for a very specific feeling of resistance. If the stick slides in too easily, that snow is too soft. If they can't push it in at all, that snow is too hard. They're looking for that just right zone where the stick meets firm resistance but can still penetrate the snow. Here's a mind-blowing stat. Experienced Inuit builders often test up to 40 different spots before finding the ideal snow for their igloo. That's a lot of poking around but it's absolutely crucial. Using the wrong type of snow would be like trying to build a brick house out of crackers. When they find the right spot, they've struck white gold. This perfectly compressed snow is actually stronger than you might think. Under the right conditions, blocks cut from sintered snow can be stronger than concrete of the same thickness, thanks to the intricate network of ice crystals that form under pressure. The science behind this is fascinating. When snow gets compacted just right, the individual snowflakes partially melt and refreeze, creating tiny ice bridges between them. This process transforms fluffy snow into a material that's both lightweight and incredibly strong. Now that we've found our perfect building material, let's talk about the tools we'll need to work with it. When it comes to building an igloo, you don't need a contractor's truck full of fancy tools. The traditional Inuit managed with just a few essential items. The star of the show is the legendary snow knife, called a pana in Inuktitut. This isn't your ordinary butter knife that's had a tough day in the freezer. The pana is a specialized tool with a long, wide blade that's specifically designed for cutting and shaping snow blocks. Think of it as a snow sword that would make any winter warrior proud. While many traditional Inuit builders still swear by the pana, some modern igloo architects have started using carpenter saws. It's kind of like upgrading from a flip phone to a smartphone. Both get the job done, but one might make things a bit easier. The saw needs to be at least two feet long to cut through the thick snow blocks properly. And no, your garden hedge trimmer won't cut it, literally. Besides the main cutting tool, you'll need a snow shovel for clearing the building site and gathering loose snow. This isn't just about keeping your workspace tidy. The loose snow becomes crucial later for filling gaps between blocks. You'll also need a measuring stick about two feet long. Traditional builders often use their forearms as a natural measuring tool, which works surprisingly well unless you happen to be built like a T-Rex. One tool that often surprises people is a pair of snow goggles. The Inuit traditionally made these from caribou antler or wood, with narrow slits to see through. They're not trying to look cool, though they definitely do, but rather protecting their eyes from snow blindness. The white snow reflects so much sunlight that working without eye protection would be like staring at a giant frozen disco ball. Now that we've got our toolkit sorted out, it's time to focus on the foundation, where every great igloo begins. The foundation of an igloo is like a first date. If you mess it up, everything that follows is doomed. That's why Inuit builders spend more time on this step than any other part of the construction process. First, they clear the site down to hard-packed snow and mark out a perfect circle using a clever technique passed down through generations. One builder stands at the center point, holding one end of a rope that's cut to the desired igloo radius. A second person walks around holding the other end taut, marking the circle in the snow, like a human compass drawing in nature's graph paper. 
The next step is cutting the snow blocks, and size really does matter here. Traditional Inuit builders cut blocks roughly two feet long, one foot high, and eight inches thick. These aren't random measurements. They're carefully calculated to be both manageable to lift and strong enough to support the structure. Getting these blocks just right is crucial. A wobbly block in your foundation is like wearing mismatched socks to a job interview. It might not be immediately obvious, but it's going to cause problems later. The first block placement is arguably the most critical moment in igloo construction. This corner stone block needs to be placed at a slight angle, leaning inward about 15 degrees. Miss this angle, and your igloo might end up looking more like a snow pile with aspirations. Builders cut the bottom of this first block at an angle, creating what engineers would call a positive angle of attack. Though the Inuit had figured this out long before modern engineering came along, each subsequent foundation block follows the same angle, creating a complete circle that already hints at the dome shape to come. With the foundation set, we're ready to start building upward, where things get really interesting. Creating the signature dome of an igloo is where building turns into an art form. It's like playing Jenga in reverse, but with snow, and if you win, you get a house. Each row of blocks needs to spiral upward and inward at just the right angle, creating that classic dome shape we all know. The mathematics behind this is pretty incredible. Each block needs to lean inward about two inches more than the block below it. Over time, this creates a perfect spiral that would make any mathematician's heart skip a beat. As the walls rise, the blocks get progressively smaller. It's not just to make things look nice. This size reduction serves a crucial engineering purpose. Larger blocks at the bottom provide a stable foundation, while smaller blocks at the top reduce weight and pressure on the structure. Think of it like a pyramid scheme, but one that actually works and doesn't end with your aunt trying to sell you essential oils. Here's a mind-boggling statistic. In a properly built igloo, each snow block carries just the right amount of weight to compress it slightly, making it stronger without crushing it. The pressure on the bottom blocks is typically around 10 pounds per square inch. Any more, and they'd crumble any less and they wouldn't bond properly. It's like nature's version of a self-tightening knot. Now let's talk about the rookie mistakes that can turn your dream dome into a snow pile. The most common error is not maintaining a consistent inward spiral. If one block strays too far in or out, it throws off the entire geometry. Another classic blunder is making the blocks too thin to save time. That's like trying to build a brick house with crackers. Some first-time builders also forget to angle their cuts properly, creating gaps that weaken the structure. And perhaps the most tempting mistake is rushing the process when you're getting tired. Remember, a hasty igloo builder soon ends up with an unexpected skylight. With the dome nearly complete, we're approaching the most crucial moment in igloo construction, placing the keystone block that will lock everything GEG -E together. The final block of an igloo, dramatically nicknamed the king block, is the architectural equivalent of threading a needle while wearing mittens. It requires precision, patience, and maybe a little bit of luck. This single block is responsible for locking the entire dome together, transforming a spiral of snow blocks into a self-supporting structure. It's like the last piece of a puzzle, except this puzzle is supporting several hundred pounds of snow over your head. The technique for cutting and placing the king block is a masterclass in precision. First, you need to cut it slightly larger than the the hole it's meant to fill. We're talking about half an inch of wiggle room here. Then comes the tricky part. The block needs to be carefully shaped, like a truncated pyramid, wider at the top than the bottom. This isn't just architectural showing off. This shape creates a wedging action that locks the entire dome together, kind of like the last piece in an arch bridge. The placement process is where things get really interesting. The block needs to be maneuvered through the hole from the outside and then rotated into position. Imagine trying to get a couch through a narrow doorway, but you're working upside down in the cold, with a block of snow that could break if you sneeze too hard. Here's a humbling statistic. Even experienced Inuit builders sometimes need two or three attempts to get this final piece just right. For first-time builders, the success rate for placing the king block correctly on the first try hovers around 10%. Once the king block is in place, there's often a tense moment of silence as everyone waits to see if it holds. When it does, the feeling of accomplishment is unmatched. You've just completed one of the most ingenious architectural designs in human history. Of course, there's still work to be done inside the igloo, but getting that final block in place is worthy of a celebration. Just try not to cheer too loudly. You don't want your victory shout to bring down the house you just built. With the king block securely in place, it's time to focus on the interior. This is where your snow shelter transforms from a basic dome into a cozy arctic apartment. The first crucial addition is the cold trap entrance, which might sound like something from a spy movie, but is actually an ingenious piece of engineering. The entrance tunnel is built slightly lower than the igloo's floor, creating a natural 
natural trap for cold air. Since cold air sinks, it pools in this lower section, instead of rising into the living space. It's like having a bouncer that only stops cold air from getting into the party. The ventilation hole is another critical feature that often surprises people. Yes, you need ventilation in a snow house. A small hole, about the size of your fist, is carved near the top of the dome. This isn't poor planning. It's essential for preventing suffocation and managing humidity. Without it, your cozy snow shelter would quickly become a foggy igloo sauna, and not in a good way. Here's where things get really interesting. The interior temperature of a properly built igloo can be up to 40 degrees Fahrenheit, warmer than the outside air. When it's minus 40 degrees Fahrenheit outside, the interior can maintain a relatively balmy 32 degrees Fahrenheit, which might not sound warm until you've spent a few hours in Arctic conditions. Body heat plays a crucial role in this warming process. But here's the clever part. As the interior warms up, a thin layer of the snow's inner surface melts slightly and then refreezes, creating a layer of ice that actually strengthens the entire structure. It's like the igloo is using your body heat to reinforce itself. Perhaps the most surprising feature is the ability to have a small fire inside. The Inuit traditionally use seal oil lamps called kuliks for both light and heat. The dome shape helps distribute the heat evenly, while the snow's insulating properties prevent it from melting. The ventilation hole carries away smoke, and that ice layer we mentioned earlier helps protect the structure. Just don't try building a bonfire. We're talking about a small, controlled flame that brings the interior temperature up to a comfortable level without turning your shelter into a snow con -y. The versatility of igloos goes far beyond just providing shelter from Arctic blasts. For Inuit hunters, these snowy structures have proven themselves as indispensable as a Swiss army knife. During hunting trips that can stretch from days to weeks, igloos serve as more than just a place to rest. They're command centers for entire hunting operations. The speed of construction is particularly impressive. Experienced builders can set up a basic hunting igloo in about two hours, which is faster than most people can figure out how to set up a complicated modern tent. But perhaps one of the most ingenious uses of igloos is for food storage. In the Arctic, where keeping meat fresh is crucial for survival, igloos act as nature's refrigerators. The stable temperature inside an igloo, consistently hovering just below freezing, creates perfect conditions for preserving meat. Even better, the solid snow walls provide excellent protection from hungry polar bears who might fancy a snack. It's like having a bear-proof freezer that builds itself. When properly maintained, these structures can last an entire hunting season. The key word here is maintained. Igloos aren't set it and forget it structures. Smart hunters regularly patch up any cracks and add fresh snow to weak spots. It's like having a house that occasionally needs a touch-up, except instead of paint, you're using snow. The maintenance process actually helps strengthen the igloo over time, as each new layer of snow adds to the insulation and structural integrity. What's particularly fascinating is how these shelters adapt to different hunting situations. A quick overnight igloo might be relatively simple, while a seasonal hunting base might feature extra amenities like storage areas or multiple rooms. Some hunting groups even create igloo clusters. Think of it as an arctic version of a hunting lodge complex, complete with separate spaces for sleeping, food storage and equipment. The design might be thousands of years old, but when it comes to surviving and thriving in one of Earth's harshest environments, igloos prove that sometimes the oldest solutions are still the best ones.